Well, can everybody hear me all right? Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you. I'm Jack Kim, the Dean of Academics here at the Command and General Staff College. It's my privilege to do the introductory comments for another fabulous uh, CASO panel that we try to do about uh, once every month or every two months to look at topics which I think are extremely important. And today, I think we have just a, a real bang-up group, a great topic. Uh, this is the ninth Cultural and Area Studies session of this academic year, and it's the second of this calendar year. So I'd like to thank all those who have made this event possible. United States Army Cultural and Area Studies Office, or CASO, the Command and General Staff College, the Global Taiwan Institute in Washington, D.C., and Harvard University's Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, the Army University and CGSC staffs, and especially the panel members who have come today. And I'd like to thank those who have come to take their time to attend in person or online to learn and benefit from this great program. Thanks for being here. The Interim National Security Strategy Guidance issued by the Biden administration in March 2021 in its first paragraph said, a growing rivalry with China, Russia, and other authoritarian states is one of the many unprecedented challenges of our time. China and Russia challenge our national security interests in different regions of the world, and China is specifically referred to by our senior leaders as the pacing threat and a systemic challenge to our global interests, starting in the Indo-PACOM region. Today's panel could not be more timely. That's particularly true as we have the second day of talks between uh, the Chinese leader Xi and with uh, Putin in Moscow. And who knows what they're discussing, but it's, uh, it's not good. So responding to these profound national security challenges today, we at Army University, United States Army Command and General Staff College, continue our series of discussions with a focus on the Indo-PACOM theater of operations. Today's panel, which is sponsored by, the, by CASO and CGSC, continue addressing strategic challenges which China and Russia are posing to the United States and our allies in the region. The topic for today's panel is Chinese leadership's increased powers, implications for global security. Today's session includes four panel members. Mr. Russell Shao, the Executive Director, Global Taiwan Institute, Washington, D.C. He is also a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation and adjunct fellow at the Pacific Forum. He is a former Penn Kimball Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy and visiting scholar at the University of Tokyo's Institute for Advanced Studi Studies on Asia. Dr. Xiong Hon Li, Harvard University's Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, is a senior fellow at the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. He is the former director of the Center for Chinese Studies at the Zhejiang Institute Policy Think Tank in South Korea. He has a Ph.D. from Tsinghua University, the alma mater of President Xi Jinping. Dr. Sean Kalik is Professor of Military History in the Department of Military History at the United States Army Command and General Staff College, where he has taught since 2004. He is a Cold War historian and lectures and publishes widely on topics of the Cold War, the post-Cold War security environment, and transnational terrorism. Dr. Joseph G.D. Babb is professor in the Department of Military History at the United States Army Command and General Staff College. He is a former United States Army Military Intelligence Officer and Defense Intelligence Agency China Analyst. He was also assigned to Hong Kong and Beijing for language and area studies. Dr. Babb has published numerous book chapters and articles on China and Asia, and he's our China expert here at Command and General Staff College. Our moderator is the famous Dr. Mahir Ibrahimov, Dr. I, as many call him. He is the director of the United States Army Cultural and Area Studies Office. He is the author of the fifth book, Across Cultures and Empires, An Immigrant's Odyssey from the Soviet Army to the U.S. War in Iraq and American Citizenship, among many other publications. Dr. I's expertise is featured in global media outlets, such as BBC World News, Los Angeles Times, movies, and Army venues. The complete bios of the panel members and the moderator can be, access, can be accessed on the CASO website. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Ibrahimov, who will continue moderating throughout the session. Thank you for coming here today. Educate to win.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, welcome, and welcome to our next CASO session. I thank you, sir, for your continued support. Next slide, please. To set the stage for today's very timely topic, as part of CASO's approach, let's take a quick look at sociocultural and historical aspects of China's concept of global governance and provide a possible parallel with a similar Russian concept, which in both cases might influence the two countries' outlook on international affairs. During our previous sessions, we discussed the Alexander Dugin's Eurasianism and the term Navarassia, New Russia concept, which might to a certain extent influence the Russian policies, including its the so-called special military operation in Ukraine, and an attempt to expand towards the historical borders of the Russian Empire. President Putin also mentioned the term in his speech in March 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, as you remember. In the case of China, we might examine a concept, the Middle Kingdom, as the China calls itself, and its possible influence on the Sino-centric worldview, which might have shaped China's outlook on rules and norms of international cooperation. In the past two, deca two decades, China has re-emerged as a major power with the world's second largest economy and an advanced military after, as our uh, East Asia uh, experts know, uh, the relative decline in 1800s and early 1900s, right? So essentially, that's the, during the last two decades, the growth had, took place. Uh, based on the topic of today's panel, I believe that above short analysis might explain to a certain extent why re-elected Chinese presidents, president puts uh, puts China's expansionist foreign policy and control at home at heart of his plans during his speech uh, at the Communist Party summit recently. In this context, there are actually five takeaways. Hong Kong and Taiwan, the economy, corruption, foreign policy, and the environment. Next slide, please. Economic potential, potential of countries is an important factor for their ability to expand influence regionally and globally, which might need to be taken into consideration by policy planners. This graphic and a short related video clearly demonstrates an impressive evolution and growth of Chinese economy based on nominal GDP between years 1980 and with a projection up to 226. As you know, gross domestic product, GDP, is the total monetary and values and services produced within the uh, certain geographical borders of a given country in a certain period of time. So that trend has been consistent in the case of Chinese economy for the last two decades and which indicates, if it's consistent, which indicates to the measure, general measurement of the health of the economy, if that makes sense to everybody. Okay? To show the evolution, to save time, we'll, be, we'll just play part of it for the latest period to show the trend. You can clearly see How's this trend been happening since 1980 and is projected by the IMF? This is the IMF statistics up to 226. Essentially, ultimately, due to the projection leading us to the second place after the United States, in terms of the percentage of the world GDP. And you can see the dynamics of the changes with other countries as well. Okay, so now, 
However, please pay attention to the source of this graphic and video, July 21. Since July 21, because of COVID and the internal policies of the, Russian, of the Chinese leadership, this dynamic might have changed, not to the uh, positive kind of, towards the positive trend, but negative trend. So the, this positive trend might not be the case anymore. That makes sense? So that was 21 July source. We are privileged to have our experts from CGSC and two guest speakers to address more specifically these and other related issues from the US and other partner nations perspectives during our session today. For outstations, the event is available live on CJSC Facebook page and video teleconference as well. The opinions and discussion points during the session are those of the speakers and the moderator and do not necessarily represent official positions of the United States government. Next slide, please. With this, I would like to yield the floor to Mr. Russell Shao, who will discuss how Chinese Communist Party's 20th Congress cements Xi Jinping's authority as the most powerful Chinese leader since the Mao period, Mao era. This presentation will assess the policy implications for cross-strait peace and stability during Xi's third term. He was elected for the third term, as you know. Mr. Xiao, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Kem and Dr. Ai and Castle for the uh, invitation to participate again this year for, uh, uh, in this discussion, a uh, very timely discussion. It's um, truly an honor and privilege to be here on stage with my esteemed co-panelists, which uh, whom I look forward to uh, learning from and engaging, and, and all of you in the audience today, both here in person as well as online, to um, uh, to listen to my presentation. As Dr. I already introduced, uh, the focus of my uh, brief presentation here will be focused on the Chinese leadership's um, increased powers and its implications for specifically on cross-strait relations, which is my area of uh, subject matter expertise. Um, so to begin, I think, uh, next slide, please. Uh, to begin, I think, I'm sorry, I think that that might be not in the, oh, that is in the order. I think my the slides that I have on my computer are the old, actually. Um, but nevertheless, that's fine, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I think when we talk about the Chinese leadership, we have to be clear that we are only talking about the Chinese Communist Party. And when we talk about the Chinese Communist Party, we are now only really talking about one man, and that's Xi Jinping. And that's the man on the left side of that, um, of, those, of this collage of photographs. Xi Jinping has systematically dismantled the succession norms established by his predecessors. And um, at the part, 20th Party Congress that was just held uh, in October of last year, uh, he has consolidated his powers uh, to a degree that, has, that makes him I believe, the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. Uh, it should have been clear, probably, perhaps as early as in 2017, that uh, Xi Jinping was planning to stick around uh, when there was no heir, appoint, heir apparent appointed uh, in the seven-member Politburo of the, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. Then in 2018, he eliminated the term limits uh, for the President of the People's Republic of China, which essentially is much more of a ceremonial role. And, he extended to that position um, with uh, no opposition, I believe, Dr. Lee, right? Um, you know, zero vote, zero vote against um, in a nominal, um, you know, rubber stamp of the National People's Congress uh, just held uh, earlier this month. Um, it is my personal opinion that Xi Jinping will stay on for a fourth term uh, after the 20th par 21st Party Congress scheduled uh, to be held in 2027. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, Xi Jinping has um, filled uh, the top echelons of the uh, Politburo Standing Committee as well as the Politburo, which is a 
a 24-member body, uh, which essentially serves as the top decision-making body of the Chinese Communist Party with his loyalists and, um, and, and sycophants. And as a result of that, I think we have to be very mindful in terms of uh, the statements uh, that uh, Xi Jinping himself has made uh, with regards to, in this particular presentation, cross-strait relations. And I think while I think most of you are very clearly aware about the military actions and activities that are taken by the People's Liberation Army within the Indo-Pacific theater, perhaps you know, the more political dimensions of the uh, cross-strait relationship may be more, um, hopefully, uh, add some more, shed some more additional light on uh, what is essentially a political military um, uh, situation that has to be resolved with both uh, political and military um, options. The first of which is that uh, during the and I'm citing here primarily only from the 20th Party Congress because as even though the National People's Congress in the two sessions was just held, as Dr. I referenced earlier, uh, again, uh, that bot, those two conclaves, the National People's Congress and what is called the CP, CCPPCC, which is the Chinese Consultative Political Conference, correct me if I'm mistaken in the full name of the, uh, the name of the, um, of the body, but essentially serves as a top advisory organ of the, um, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the United Front system. Uh, but policy is directed by the Chinese Communist Party, and as such, the most important sources, uh, more authoritative sources to draw from in terms of signals for policy uh, are, are, should, should be drawn from the Party Congress itself. And in it, I drew four, essentially four themes um, as it relates to uh, Taiwan. Uh, the first of which is, uh, on the top left, the emphasis on peaceful reunification under one country, two systems. Uh, contrary to the notion that, um, that the PRC, that this Communist Party has sort of um, given up uh, any political um, options to resolve the cross-street dispute, there still tends to be an emphasis on the need uh, approach to peaceful reunification with Taiwan under the model of one country, two systems. Many of you may be familiar with this model, which is actually essentially the model by which they have applied to Hong Kong. And uh, I think since 2018, 2019 onwards, it's clear to see that that, is, um, that, that has uh, absolutely no currency um, in Taiwan either. Uh, but yet, nonetheless, it remains the, uh, the model by which the, uh, Beijing insists upon um, its uh, re uh, reunification uh, discussions with uh, Taipei. Uh, the second theme is an emphasis on the One China Principle and the so-called 1992 consensus. The One China Principle, of course, has been utilized by the People, People's Republic of China to marginalize uh, Taiwan's international space since 1972 onwards when uh, the PRC was able to um, uh, obtain uh, the seat of the UN at the United Nations systems. Uh, nonetheless, the resolution UN 275H, which disposed of the issue of who gets the seat of the UN, was actually ha has been manipulated by Beijing to actually create a one, sort of a, a system-wide exclusion of Taiwan from any international body, which, in fact, if you go into the record in terms of the debates of that resolution, it only disposed of a very narrow issue as opposed to what the, uh, the PRC has been able to achieve by util leveraging its, both its dipl diplomatic as well as economic um, power uh, to, uh, to, to create this, uh, these political conditions that have um, essentially uh, distorted uh, the, the meaning of UN 2758, uh, the resolution. The third theme, uh, which is relatively, the first two themes that I identified here are, are not new, um, but the third theme here that I will mention, uh, it emphasis on the protection against external interference in, in Taiwan separatists. Uh, is relatively new, especially the first clause of which, which I think has definitely come from a, 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 a growing uh, concern within Beijing uh, from what it sees as sort of the internationalization of the, of the Taiwan issue and this breaking out of its incessant efforts to try to internalize 
the cross-strait dispute as an internal Chinese matter and, and does not, uh, in, its, you know, in its view, brook in external interference. And um, not taking into account, of course, that um, much of its activities in unilaterally changing the status quo, certainly over the last six years, but well over the last decade in terms of its um, uh, increased military buildup uh, and moving to the fourth theme, fourth theme, the re continued refusal to renounce the use of military force uh, to coerce um, Taiwan into uh, a political sediment has actually created the conditions that have uh, really, uh, you know, uh, necessitated uh, a, a overall overdue change in direction in terms of uh, policies uh, in both in Washington as well as internationally with regards to maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The fourth, re fourth theme that I already mentioned also as well, which is, um, which is the, the refusal to renounce the use of military force has continued to be a, uh, a, a mainstay of its uh, overall emphasis on its approach to cross-strait relations, and it remained the same in the 20th Party Congress, and in it, Xi Jinping quotes uh, that the CCP will never, rena never promise to renounce the use of force with regards to Taiwan. Um, some of the notable other developments also from the 20th Party Congress is that uh, the CCP Constitution was also revised, the party constitution, uh, to enshrine the one country, two system model into the constitution as well as uh, resolutely opposing as well as deterring separatists seeking Taiwan independence. Um, and in that, you know, uh, the reading into that uh, that, uh, that action in enshrining uh, these uh, clauses into the Constitution does seem to suggest that there is a sort of a generational uh, element in terms of its approach to uh, dealing with this issue, which does sort of cut against uh, some of the uh, earlier assessments that have been made about a, a, a greater sense of urgency uh, that uh, the Xi Jinping uh, and the leadership has with regards to resolving uh, the cross-strait dispute uh, under his term. Um, you know, there are a lot of other statements that I can go into with regards to how Xi Jinping views the cross-strait dispute and issues that we can get into uh, later, but I think these are the four major broad themes that I want to be able to highlight uh, in terms of the political dimensions of the 20th Party Congress uh, so that it can provide some, I think, uh, maybe layers uh, to your understanding about certainly the, the very um, uh, increasingly provocative and, uh, and, and, and militarily uh, uh, significant uh, activities that uh, the PLA has taken certainly uh, in, in the last, uh, in the last uh, six years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I know that I mentioned earlier that, you know, what, who we were talking about really is one man, uh, Xi Jinping. but. Also, personnel is policy in, this, in the Chinese Communist Party, and having, you know, I think, and highlighting two key individuals that I think will have uh, an outsized role in helping to shape as well as implement uh, Xi Jinping's Taiwan policy. One from the Polar Barrel Standing Committee on the side of the, um, on, uh, on, on the more political uh, side is Wang Huning, uh, which is the fourth ranking P Polar Barrel Standing Committee member. Um, these two individuals, aside from uh, Xi Jinping, Wang Huning is probably arguably the most important um, uh, uh, Communist Party official uh, in the Taiwan-related policy uh, making apparatus. Uh, that includes his position as chairman, as I mentioned earlier, of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. I finally got it's a mouthful, so I just call it CPPCC. Um, as well as in that, in that capacity, making him the deputy director of the Central Affairs Leading Small Group on, uh, on Taiwan, which is essentially an interagency working group that's headed by Xi Jinping himself, uh, of which Wang Huning in his, uh, in, his, in his capacity as the chairman of the CCPPCC, uh, it serves as a deputy director, and this has been a continuous uh, sort, of an, um, uh, sort of norm in how this, uh, this, policy, this, this Taiwan policy apparatus is, uh, is, um, is executed. Um, secondly, um, well, another, another interesting point to make about Wang Huning also is that uh, he is really considered to be the ideology and propaganda czar of, uh, the, uh, of Xi Jinping. 
He is sort of the intellectual um, godfather, if you will, of uh, many of the, uh, the predecessors' main uh, foreign policy um, uh, mantras uh, to include, of course, um, um, to include, of course, Jiang uh, Zemin's uh, uh, three represents, uh, as well as Hu Jintao's scientific uh, development uh, concept. And he's also accredited to developing Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. Uh, and as such, um, you know, this individual is considered to be a, a very ideological hardline, which also will have, I think, important implications for for a hardening of of of, of the PRC's approach, which is in line with of, uh, of uh, Xi Jinping's um, ideas. On the military side, one person to particularly note is uh, General, General He Weidong. Uh, he was the um, commander of the Eastern Theater Command, which um, you know, uh, he was catapulted actually from at the, uh, the National, um, excuse me, at the, at the Party Congress as the second vice chairman. Uh, despite not having been a prior CMC member, which breaks the norms in terms of where, how you get to that position in the past. Uh, and then he was, as I mentioned earlier, the commander of the Eastern Theater Command, which oversees PLA activities against Taiwan. That was from 2019 to 2022. He was also the deputy commander of the Western Theater Command um, and, commander, um, and commander of the Western Theater Command Army during the, actually the skirmishes that uh, the, uh, the Chinese had with the Indians also as well. Uh, this does seem to suggest that the uh, their, that operational experience with regards to uh, running a joint command and political ties uh, with Xi Jinping's um, or, are, are really valued uh, under, um, you know, by Xi and, and, and are likely causes. Uh, for uh, the promotions of these two, uh, uh, I think, key individuals who will have uh, important roles to play in uh, regards to executing the policies of Xi Jinping during his uh, third term. Next slide. I know another issue, of course, that's on a lot of people's mind, of course, is the timeline uh, with regards to uh, whether or not uh, the PLA will um, win uh, and if uh, Ty um, the, uh, the PLA will uh, invade Taiwan. Um, I think here there is um, an important um, statement, an assessment uh, made by William Burns, the CIA director, uh, in a uh, Face the Nation interview that he delivered uh, in February 26th of this year. And here I think it's worth quoting in full that statement to get a, a, a clear assessment of what he said with regards to the IC's assessment on, um, on, on the PLA threat to uh, threat of invasion to Taiwan. And I'll quote here, I think we need to take very seriously Xi's ambitions with regard to ultimately controlling Taiwan. That doesn't, however, in our view, mean that a military conflict is inevitable. We do know, as has been made public, that President Xi has instructed the PLA, the Chinese military leadership, to be ready by 2027 to invade Taiwan. But that doesn't mean that he's decided to invade in 2027 or any other year as well. I think our judgment at least is that President Xi and his military leadership have doubts today about whether they could accomplish that invasion. Next slide. So, what is more, what, while that is the most destructive scenario in terms of what, what, uh, what the PLA will do uh, to Taiwan, what are perhaps much more uh, likely uh, activities and actions that PLA, uh, well, the Chinese uh, leadership, uh, including the military, can take with regards to um, pursuing its goal of, of uh, actively pursuing, uh, reunif quote, unification with Taiwan. I think these activities fall under a much more broader framework of political and hybrid warfare. Uh, certainly there will be a intensification of uh, military gray zone activities and I think it's been pretty well um, uh, clearly established by uh, a lot of uh, you know, reporting on these matters in terms of the massive incursions of fighter jets across the, uh, the Taiwan Strait Center Line, um, the missile tests that occurred bracketing Taiwan, some of which overflew uh, the, the main island of Taiwan during the uh, August exercises of last year, uh, propaganda and cyber attacks. Uh, they were also, you know, conduct uh, drone operations over the offshore islands of Taiwan that um, violated Taiwan's airspace. Um, and naval exercises as well as uh, joint blockade um, 
although there are uh, very little specifics as to some of these uh, types of um, um, uh, training exercises, a lot of it has been, at least thus far, uh, a lot of propaganda that has been amplifying the type of actions that they would take to simulate a, 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 a blockade, but signaling that that's something that they are, um, that they are actively um, you know, considering. Uh, it is worth noting that a lot of times these, these types of uh, military gray zone activities have there have been known physical intrusions at least in terms of the Taiwan's territorial waters, especially during the last massive scale of exercises in August where there were six exclusion zones that were designated following um, then Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. But those six exclusion zones actually, some of which the, if you, you know, plot into coordinates, have actually do intrude upon territorial waters of of Taiwan, and um, but yet there was no actual physical intrusions during those exercises uh, by uh, the PLA. It's also worth noting, at least in the missile test that occurred during that time frame, that uh, these mis some of these missiles actually flow into the exclusive economic zones of Japan and Philippines. So the signaling there, I think it was not by coincidence that they decided to do so. I think it was, a pro again, it, I think it goes back to that point, that theme that I made earlier about the external uh, and, you know, guarding against external inf uh, interference and, you know, I think seeing that uh, uh, these are, you know, again, political signals that, uh, the PL, uh, that the Chinese leadership is sending. Um, certainly a continuous act level of, of activities regarding political subversion through United Front tactics, um, information operations, as I mentioned earlier, through propaganda and disinformation. Um, uh, certainly containing Taiwan's diplomatic and international space. I think that's a, something that's ongoing right now with regards to Honduras. Um, and um, non-military gray zone activities that could involve their use of their coast guards and maritime militias. Um, mentioned earlier drones, underwater um, uh, unmanned vehicles. Uh, there was an incident fairly recently with regards to submarine cables uh, connecting one of the offshore islands being cut completely by um, a fishing trawler, um, and uh, and you know that raised a lot of concerns with regards to what type of activities they can undertake. Certainly, economic warfare and cyber uh, are options that they uh, have utilized, have shown uh, that they can, and 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 are likely to do so, and other forms of traditional espionage and hostage uh, diplomacy. Uh, next slide, please. And for final slide, really, just going back to the essence of the timeline issue, um, you know, I think as far as what, you know, we do know uh, with regards to a, 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 a more sort of clear timeline is from what Xi Jinping himself has said before, and that is, and I quote here, resolving the Taiwan question, realizing China's complete reunification is for the party a historic mission and an unshakable commitment. It is also a shared aspiration of all the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation uh, no and a natural it. requirement for realizing the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. I italicized that last statement, a natural requirement for the realizing the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation because actually, in fact, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has given a deadline for when they want to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and that is by 2049. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and yield the floor back. Thank you, Mr. Shaw, for the great presentation. I want to acknowledge that. Next slide, please. The next speaker is Dr. Lee, who will tackle how amid intensifying U.S.-China rivalry that has now expanded from the economic military arena to the ideological realm, the strategic importance of socialist North Korea, as the Chinese President Xi Jinping put it to China is bound to deepen. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, I, for having me today. And also, uh, I want to thank Jack, uh, Dr. Jack Kim and also Robert Davis, Davis, Professor here, for having me today. Uh, I know that many of you just had a lunch, and uh, it's that time of the day uh, when we need to hear a story. It's a story time, and I'm here to tell you a story is a story between two countries, that is China and North Korea. It's a very big, broad topic, so I'll just focus on recent episode about the five summits that Xi Jinping held with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, in 2018 and going over to 2019. Right now, as you know, Xi Jinping is in Moscow 
The last time Xi Jinping met with Putin was uh, February last year. So it's about a bit over one year. And the Xi Jinping meeting uh, Putin second time. About the same period, Xi Jinping met Kim Jong-un in 2018 and 19 five times, five times. So I'm going to tell you what happened, what happened in that very intense uh, period of five times. Such frequency of summits is certainly very uncommon in international politics. Uh, the summitry was initiated by Kim Jong-un, who was preparing for an unprecedented uh, historic meeting with that U.S. President Donald Trump right, in Singapore. And the North Korean leader never had a meeting with a sitting U.S. president to hold the summit. So surprisingly, Xi Jinping ambushed uh, a, a, you know, the supposed meeting between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. And Xi Jinping met with Kim Jong-un first ahead of what's going to happen between uh, uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un is a young, inexperienced leader a novice in international politics. He never met Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, on the other hand, met with Donald Trump twice already at the time. So Kim Jong-un wanted to have some advice from Xi Jinping how to deal with uh, Donald Trump. Next slide. Uh, where is the slide? Just, just look at me, focus on that's fine. At the time, most media reports at the time focused on Kim Jong-un, not Xi Jinping. After all, it was very rare for the leader of a hermit kingdom to make an international travel, which would expose himself to the international media scrutiny. In doing so, the media focus, I think, neglected to raise the question of what Xi Jinping wanted from Kim Jong-un. You know, we focused on what Kim Jong-un wanted from meeting with Xi Jinping to get advice about Trump. But on the other hand, we didn't focus on what Xi Jinping wanted to get out of these five intense meetings with Kim Jong-un. Like one every three months, Xi Jinping met with Kim Jong-un consecutively. She would not simply host Kim Jong-un just to pass on the art of negotiation with Trump. Expectedly, during the first summit in Beijing between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un's uh, remarks were generally centered around uh, nuclear negotiations because Kim Jong-un was supposed to have a nuclear negotiation with Trump. Interesting thing happened starting from the second summit. Uh, from the second summit, between Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping in the Chinese city of Dalian, Kim Jong-un began to use the vocabularies such as China and North Korea are one destiny. China and North Korea are one family. We are brothers to describe China-North Korea relations. In fact, these are the exact terminologies Xi Jinping used during the first meeting. So apparently, Kim was uh, beginning to adopt semantic cues, language cues from Xi Jinping. I thought this was beginning to be very interesting. I watched their summit very carefully. I read all the foreign ministry texts from China and North Korea. I watched all the video freezes from the uh, five summits over and over again. And during their meeting, Xi Jinping also proposed the future vision between China and North Korea. One of them was that you know, China, China is going to support socialist North Korea forever. This is a very interesting terminology because China is going to support North Korea. That's fine. But when Xi Jinping said China is going to support socialist North Korea putting together, whether you believe it or not, Xi Jinping never said that before. 
putting these two vocabularies together. Of course, both China and North Korea, they are socialist countries. But then, strangely, they never used that before. It's the Xi Jinping who used that socialist North Korea. We're going to support socialist North Korea, whenever he used that. So it was me and also other Chinese analysts began to, oh, it's interesting. Whenever Xi Jinping met with Kim Jong-un, he used the exact vocabulary that socialist North Korea, that's the North Korea that I'm going to support. That's a very interesting. As you know, Xi Jinping is a very ideological leader. He truly believes in socialism in the 21st century. Xi Jinping also resurrected the terminologies of uh, describing China and North Korea, such as alliance soaked in blood. You usually say it's a blood alliance, but the exact Chinese terminology is that, you know, the yi. That means that, you know, alliance soaked in blood. Or Xi Jinping also used our relationship between China and North Korea is the lips and teeth relationship. Lips and teeth. When the lips are cold, the teeth are also cold. It's a symbiotic relationship. Interestingly, these are the exact vocabularies Mao Zedong used 70, 70 years ago to North Korean founder Kim Il-sung, 17 years ago. Now, the future generations, leaders of China and North Korea as a young leader, they are beginning to use this Cold War vocabularies after 70 years of their grandfather used. During their fifth and final summit, which was held in Pyongyang in 2019, Xi Jinping told Kim Jong-un the essential characteristic, essential characteristic of China-North Korea relations lies in being a socialist state led by Communist Party. Xi Jinping's special emphasis on the vocabulary socialism in his meetings with Kim Jong-un was something that Chinese scholars also pay attention to. It is very interesting. Our leader, whenever he meets with Kim Jong-un, he just repeats the vocabulary socialism, 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 and our countries are both a socialist state. And in response, Kim Jong-un said, I, Kim Jong-un, of course I'm not Kim Jong-un, but I confirm that with General Secretary Xi that adhering to the socialist system is the key to maintaining North Korea-China friendship. This is what Kim Jong-un said in response. So this is my analysis. Xi Jinping's repeated emphasis on vocabulary socialism mixed with the Cold War fraternity languages intended for arousing emotional bonding between the two leaders through a series of multiple summits appear to have the impact of indoctrination over Kim Jong-un. In a sense, the five back-to-back -back summits could be seen as five therapy sessions staged by Xi Jinping to have Kim breached in the socialism indoctrination. During the fifth and final summit, Kim said, this is what Kim Jong-un said to Xi Jinping, socialism is the unchanging essence of DPRK-China relationship, adding confessionally, I once again confirm the truth. Kim Jong-un is confirming the truth. I once again confirm the truth, which is that DPRK-China friendship is a unique, invincible, as it adheres to and glorifies socialism. I'm not sure whether you go to church or not, but probably this kind of language is very religious confession that usually you use in, at the church, not in the communist leaders' dialogue. But they upgraded their friendship in a level to the level of a religious relationship, in a way. And that religion is socialism. To conclude, Xi Jinping seemed to have achieved considerable success in bringing the new generation of a young North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, 
who was at that time only 34 years old, to inch close to China's side by repeatedly highlighting the strategic intersections of the relationship that underscore the duo's ideological homogeneity, impl implanting socialist consciousness so as to increase mutual personal bonding and ideological solidarity. And this appeared to have turned out very effective strategy in keeping Kim firmly stay in the orbit of Xi Jinping's influence. Remember at the time, Kim Jong-un was had, trying to have a negotiation with Trump so that you know, Kim Jong-un might get close to Trump, but Xi Jinping ambushed and Xi Jinping held the summit with the five summits with Kim Jong-un, and now Kim Jong-un is firmly in the orbit of Xi Jinping. So to recap, Xi Jinping planted a gradual step-by-step -step influence over Kim Jong-un during the process of a five summit, and Xi Jinping's efforts, Xi Jinping's efforts yielded considerable results. Most importantly, Kim began to imitate Xi Jinping by using Xi Jinping's signature vocabularies as he progressed from the first summit to the fifth summit meetings. How can you know this? Do you have evidence? Of course, because I'm a good scholar, I have evidence to show to you. During this meeting on the days leading up to the Singapore summit in 2018, initially, Kim Jong-un was very eager for a summit opportunity with the U.S. president. However, Kim became cautious and vigilant as the Singapore summit date approached. And noticing Kim Jong-un's uh, you know, you know, evident change in Kim Jong-un's attitude, Trump publicly suspected that Xi Jinping was pulling strings behind Kim Jong-un. Quote, this is what Trump said. When Kim Jong-un had a meeting with President Xi in China, you know, the second meeting, that's what I'm talking about. I think there was a little bit of change in the attitude of Kim Jong-un. So I don't like that. And Trump repeated, I don't like that. So Trump sensed that, you know, Kim Jong-un was supposed to meet with him, but when Kim Jong-un met with Xi Jinping first, and Kim Jong-un's attitude changed. So this is uh, what you know, Trump was complaining. And Trump's suspicion was not without merit. In fact, before and after each of Kim's two summit meetings with Trump, Xi Jinping met with Kim Jong-un each time as if coaching Kim in the form of in-briefing and also out-briefing. And in a broader context for Xi Jinping, those five summit sessions were a reminder that whatever Kim's engagement with Trump may offer to North Korea, it is Xi Jinping, not Trump. It is Xi Jinping who remains Kim's most important ally. It's like a public warning to Trump that Kim Jong-un is my guy, so you cannot take him away from me. So I think this Xi Jinping's psychological indoctrination over Kim Jong-un actually had a, quite a successful impact because after the summit with uh, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un said North Korea and China would work together as one unified command center in dealing with international affairs. So I'll stop here and uh, take questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for very interesting analysis. Acknowledge that. Our next speaker is Dr. Kalik, who will provide the, his analysis on the evolution of Soviet, Russo, Chinese relations as a historical perspective. Another great topic. Dr. Kalik, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to thank Drs. Kim, Davis, and Ibrahimov for being part of this panel. And I'm kind of the odd man out up here in that I'm a U.S. Soviet specialist, by no way Chinese specialist. So I'm do my best. But the point about one, two nations going together kind of fits with the Sino-Soviet relationships. And I'll give you one slide, please. Um, put everything on one quick slide, four main points, right? So next slide, please. Next slide. Really, we'll look at it through the leadership 
perspective of the Soviet Union and what China is getting out of it, uh, what the Soviets are getting out of it, then ultimately we can leave for the discussion period what's going on right now as we speak in Moscow between uh, Xi and, and our good friend Putin. Um, we like to think about from the Cold War perspective that as, as communist nations, these two were brothers in arms throughout the duration of the Cold War, but the truth and the reality is something much different and much more complex than that, as a matter of fact. So I'll break it up into four, four, four loose periods, um, about seven minutes. So I always get myself in these predicaments, like, you know, big historical questions, complex history in short chunks. So I don't know how I do that, but thank you. Uh, the first, first era is one of a communist era, which is really post post World War II, uh, the beginning of the Cold War, and what we have is you have the situation in China going down the tubes with the Marshall or with the Truman administration, Marshall making visits there and figuring out who's going to win, what's going to go on. Um, Stalin's perspective from this period really is he hopes that China, China, the, the communists win, the Mao wins, but the reality is he has much bigger fish to fry at home as he's going through another purge and as he's trying to get his nation back from uh, the wreckage that took place during the Second World War. When you lose 27 million people, you have a little bit of uh, rebuilding to do. So the initial period, 45 to say 49, is one of kind of tangential relationships where you don't have a whole lot of support from the Soviet Union to Mao besides kind of, you know, attaboy, go get them, we'll give you material support if and when we can, and then we go from there. Once um, Mao wins in 49, which ironically is the same year that Tal Stalin tests his first atomic bomb, which is pretty significant in that initial Cold War period, it demonstrates that there seems to be a new tide shifting in the context of what we're going to call containment strategy uh, from the U.S. perspective, that the communists really seem to be on the rise. So if you think about what's happening between, say, 47 to 50, from the Truman perspective, you're going to lose Czechoslovakia to the Reds, you're going to lose Hungary to the Reds, the Iron Curtain descends, all of a sudden, the Soviet Union detonates its first atomic bomb, which we didn't think they were going to get until 55, but now it's 49. And then all of a sudden, China goes red. Now, the significance of this is not just that the shift of the Cold War dynamic is, is fundamentally changing, but it also demonstrates that our initial obsession with the Cold War from the U.S. perspective is, is Europe. But once China goes red, it becomes now it's a global problem, and we're going to shift our attention not just to Europe, but also to Asia as well. Um, from Stalin's perspective, once China goes red, he sees it as an ally, but there's going to be a fundamental problem here between Stalin and Mao, that Mao and, and Stalin don't necessarily get along very well. Uh, as you well may know, Stalin may not be the most happy get-go-along, get-along kind of guy. Um, and there's a rift on who is kind of the true heir of the communist legacy. Who's going to lead the worldwide revolution? The reality is Stalin, who's an old Bolshevik and has been around for a while, believes it is the Soviet Union. They are the vanguard of the mantle of what will become Marxism-Leninism. Mao, however, has a different perspective because he has time on his side and vast numbers of population on his side as well. So from the very beginning of this relationship, it is anything but an equal co-partnership of you know, all communist brothers for one. There is a lot of... Um, strategizing and thinking about the future in a, in a unique way. And one of the main cruxes that comes, brings them together, but also is going to be a dividing point, is the Korean War. Uh, as you well may know, the, the North Koreans will approach Stalin first and ask for support. And Stalin, and this is kind of recent history, by the way, Stalin isn't necessarily real happy about the idea of going to war against the Americans and or South Korea, by the way, because, again, he has to put his nation packed together. And he essentially tells the North Koreans, lukewarm about the idea. However, if you go talk to Mao, and if Mao says yes, I'll give you material support. Uh, lo and behold, Mao says yes, which Mao takes as he's the front runner and the biggest supporter of this Korean endeavor. And Stalin is a secondary proponent, which Stalin sees it almost to the inverse, by the way. And again, I would argue the root of this relationship really is who is the top communist? Is it the Soviet Union or is it China? The Soviet Union is always going to believe it's themselves. The Chinese believe, no, no, they're the first power that kind of brings it to fruition. We are accelerating it to a much higher level. So there's this tension between who is the true um, uh, top dog of the communist world. So Korea becomes one of the first major uh, points about supporting communism, expanding it uh, in, in Asia, but yet who's going to support, which Mao's going to support with materiel. Lots of manpower get actively involved in the fight, as are the Russians, or the Soviets, sorry, um, with you know, some artillery advisors, artillery support, uh, as far as material, air power, some pilots and advisors. But the reality is the Chinese have a much greater stake because they share a border with North Korea 
compared to the Soviets. We share a small, small border with it. And again, this, I would argue, Korea becomes this uh, fissure between Mao and Stalin that never get, necessarily gets resolved until Stalin's death in 53. Um, the second era is the one for you know, a new communist bloc, which is probably the happiest period of the relationship between the two nations in many ways. Uh, once we get through the end fighting in the, in the Soviet system on who's going to ascend to the presidency or the first general secretary position after Stalin, and it becomes Khrushchev. Khrushchev is a much bolder uh, communist in the idea that he believes that under the Bolshe or the, I'm sorry, the, um, the Khrushchev doctrine that we have a right to kind of expand communism and, and solidify these spheres of influence is what he calls them. And he sees that Chinese, the China and the Chinese are a critical part of this expansion of communism around the globe. And the idea is if the United States is, is, is allowed to have Western Europe and the Soviet Union is allowed to have Eastern Europe and then Latin America, Africa, and Asia are up for grabs. If you have the Chinese as part of your team, you can now extend a greater, broader sphere of influence within Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, if possible. And now you have essentially two large communist spheres of influence versus the US one sphere of influence. So in many ways, I would argue the second period is a much more um, positive period in Sino-Soviet relationships, simply because Khrushchev is going to allow Mao to be a critical part of this discussion as they define and try to work towards greater spheres of influence, both in Asia and then ultimately in Latin America and Africa from the Soviet perspective as well. The problem is, is that you never get through that same perspective that, we, that was between Mao and Stalin, and the fact that who is truly the future of the communist system. Khrushchev, again, is going to believe it's himself because, again, old Bolsheviks, right? Mao sees Khrushchev's recognition of having a piece in this carving out of a sphere of influence in Asia as a recognition of at least a co-power, if not a recognition of peer power. So again, if you're Mao, you're thinking, okay, Stalin didn't like me, I'm kind of, you know, second tier power, all of a sudden Khrushchev has now elevated me to at least a peer competitor status within the communist sphere. So from your position, it seems that you're at least gaining power in this monolithic communist perspective from our, um, from the U.S. position. And again, we need to remember that from the U.S. Western perspective that we always thought that the, the epicenter of communism was really Moscow. The reality is, as George Kennan points out as early as 46, it really is, has uh, really Yugoslavia is one unique element, Moscow is one unique element, and, and by the way, the Chinese are one unique element. It's never a unified effort to begin with. Um, but Kennan's idea kind of dies away because Americans aren't very good at recognizing shades of red. We just like, you know, it's either with us or against us. So it's a problem. And, and Mao's pretty good at that, right? So the second period, which is going to last up through, I would argue, I have the date 59, but the reality is I cut it off at 59 simply because Khrushchev's going to continue on for a few more years, but the rift doesn't go away. Right, it's kind of mended over in the early years after Korea. So really, say 53 through 54, 55, 56, 57, things are going pretty well as the adventurism of the Soviets is getting a little, little more uh, stronger in post-colonial North, uh, uh, post North Africa, Africa, and Latin America. And as China's starting to kind of get its legs underneath it after, after solidifying power um, and then helping the North Koreans, and then there's still this little thing called Indochina happening where the Viet Minh, who were communists as well, are going to you know, beat the French and throw the French out. So it's significant in the fact that if you follow DMB and Fu, a lot of the weapons that the Viet Minh used were actually captured by the Chinese, U.S. equipment, by the way, and then given to their communist brothers to help defeat the French. So there's this unique relationship that, you know, worldwide revolution, the brothers work together, but yet there's that still, there's that debate on who is really the top dog. Um, the Withering Alliance, which is the third section, which is going to happen kind of at the end or kind of midway through Khrushchev's era. And when you think about it, and I'll leave it to these distinguished gentlemen to kind of handle this issue, that the Sino-Soviet split, right? There's no definitive date on when it happens. It kind of just slowly evolves through time. But I would argue it seems to be there almost from the beginning. In the mid-60s is when it's going to get kind of pinpointed. In fact, I think one of the agreed-upon points is about 1964 is when it truly happens. But it starts to wither at the end of Khrushchev's kind of endeavors in the Soviet Union because he's getting more and more adventurous. Think of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Think of Berlin Wall. 
and Mao sees that as somewhat provocative and dangerous, that he's paying more attention to the United States and this game of brinksmanship and trying to solidify a greater sphere of influence within Eastern Europe as, uh, as compared to trying to expand the worldwide communist movement throughout um, Asia and the world, okay? So this withering alliance structure is going to last really through Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and, and dare we say, the, the quick and drop off Chernyanko period, right? Uh, so the withering alliance is going to last kind of the, the winter period of Sino-Soviet relationships. So it's really, it's at its low point. So if the Stalin period is kind of lukewarm, okay, we're going to get together because we're both communists. Khrushchev, I would argue, is probably one of the high points of that period. It's going to start to kind of decline significantly and kind of just go flat line, maybe plateau in this period to say in mid 60s through 84 through Brezhnev and drop off Chernyanko. They're both working towards uh, solidifying their own spheres of influence. Um, Mao is doing a pretty decent job with uh, doing, uh, solidifying um, his military power and economic power. Um, one of the highlights of this era is really, and this is, this is going to be a, a major point within the, the Soviet perspective, which is ironic, I think, that the picture of Mao and Nixon seems to indicate to the Soviets that Mao is now selling out and trying to do something unique and independent. Um, which is ironic because Brezhnev's doing the same thing with Nixon, by the way. And it actually starts with Johnson administration. So, again, this rift that you see on, on who's the top communist in the world, right? And I would argue that, again, that's the foundation of this relationship on who truly holds the future of Marxism. And by the, this withering alliance period, I, I would argue that Mao seems to have assumed the mantle because the Soviet system is suffering significant economic crises significant political crises, and then some significant military crises. So 60 to 84 is a long time period, but the reality is I think you start to see the ascendancy of what becomes a stronger Chinese state and the assumption of the mantle that they are the true uh, progeny of the communist world versus the Soviet Union, which is having all kinds of systemic problems um, around the globe, by the way. The Brezhnev Doctrine feeds into this which they become much more adventurous in Latin America. And again, Mao doesn't see the benefit of extending communism to Latin America simply because it's pulling away from the unified effort of China and the Soviet Union, which they also go through a few border skirmishes in this period too, by the way, which, which never really helps relations, by the way. Um, the last period is Gorbachev, right? Now, I won't do a whole lot of talking about it and drop off Chernyanko because they don't do much, right? They kind of just wither away. Um, Gorbachev, as, he's, as he enacts an effort to save the, the, the crippling or withering Soviet Union with the glasnost and perestroika once again sees China as a faithful ally. Uh, so Mao has, has departed the scene. We have Deng Xiaoping uh, as the new leader. And Gorbachev from 85, 86 on is going to try to recultivate this relationship. And what's unique is that he's recultivating this relationship for, for several reasons. First and foremost is economic stability. The Soviet system is on the verge of collapse. It's having its adventurous uh, problems in Afghanistan, and it needs some lifeline because the U.S. and Western Europe are getting stronger and stronger, it seems, especially as we enter into kind of the late 80s, the information revolution, the computer revolution. Um, they also need a friend in power. And again, Gorbachev, remember, Gorbachev doesn't come into power seeking to wreck the Soviet Union. He comes to power seeking to reform the Soviet Union and, again, make the Soviet Union great again. And he sees a new invigorated relationship with China as critical to that success. So if you can recapture kind of the highlight of the Khrushchev period and become brothers in arms once again and start to work towards one socialist country or one socialist nation around the globe uh, with the face of new socialism, right? A kind of general socialism that's good for everybody. Um, maybe that can pull them both out of the Soviet slump. Um, they're making pretty good progress, I think, until the Soviet Union collapses in 89 through 92, and that slow kind of withering decay. Um, I think the, the period we're seeing now, um, not much, let me, let me back up. The Yeltsin kind of period, right? The, the new Russia is another kind of problematic period where China becomes, I think, much stronger and solidified as the Soviet Union goes through its, its unique kind of turmoil and walk through the wilderness. Putin is going to resurrect that in 2000. I think what you see post-2000 really is a new attempt to revive this relationship that Gorbachev started, but the reality is, from, from my perspective, and I'll, I'll be glad to demur to the gentleman on, on the panel, that there's been an inverse in that relationship, though, however. The Soviet Union slash Russia is no longer the top dog. 
They are in, in every bit the, the inferior power now, and now China is truly the strongest power, and now you're going to see them play a much stronger role as Russia becomes more and more isolated until we get to 2021, 20, 22, 23. And with that, I'll uh, pass the baton to Jeff Babb. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for a very informative presentation. Appreciate that. How's everybody so far? Everybody's doing well? So far, so good? So we're going to have more action from this area, intellectual activities. So it's going to be more interesting. So the next speaker is Dr. Babb, who will discuss the evolution of Sino-American relations. Dr. Babb, the floor is yours. Uh, next slide, please. As this slide indicates, um, it does not start well with us in 1950. So you see the elder Kim and Mao, and now we will basically see my four pieces. Uh, enemy to friend, friend to responsible stakeholder, collabor collaborator to competitor, and competitor to enemy. So I'll kind of follow Dr. Kalick's model and look through four of these, but I'm going to let you do the reading part of this. Next slide. In the red, the Korean War is the low point. It is where China and the United States fight to a standoff. The argument is still out there in terms of who won. We returned it to the status quo ante, and we're still there, and it's stable. Two Taiwan Straits crises. We won't see another one, really, until 96. And then, and I had this discussion a little bit earlier, uh, whatever we're going to call the Pelosi visit in the future when we look back on it, is it a real crisis or not? The Tibetan uprising. Um, every time you see the President of the United States shaking hands with the Dalai Lama, think about how the Chinese see it in 1959. And then China's support to North Vietnam. The interesting thing is that will end in the 71 to 75 period with Nixon seeking China's help to get out of Vietnam. So you see this enemy to friend emerge over that period. And of course, the Nixon visit in 72. So the greatest anti-communist in American presidential history becomes the guy that's able to go to China during its most extreme period, during the Cultural Revolution, where Mao was killing about 30 million people. We make friends with the Chinese. When we start thinking about oh, we're picking on the Chinese because what they're doing with the Uyghurs or what they're doing in other places. Remember when we made friends with China and what was going on in China at that time. Next slide, please. Friend or responsible stakeholder. Formal recognition. And you see the wonderful picture of, of, of Deng Xiaoping and, and President Carter. Now, that all should have come to an end in 1989, but it didn't, because the relationship needed to endure, and probably would have had not the Berlin Wall fallen. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall, things really start to change everywhere. And we, I would argue we didn't know really where we were going, but we did know that China was the rising power. Embassy bombing in Serbia I think is another interesting, the Chinese still claim that that was done on purpose. I think the United States Air Force does too, but can't say that. Um, at the end of the day, the Chinese cannot believe that the American power, the great American military could make that kind of mistake. It had to be done on purpose. So that's what the Chinese perceive, whether it's true or not. Next slide, please. I skipped the EP3. We got the EP3 back in a matter of days. We didn't, we didn't get the Pueblo back ever. 
There's a difference in, in North Korea and China that we have to look at. They're not the same place. Um, the U.S. then, uh, warning on the South China Sea. We caught, Deng Xiao, we caught Xi Jinping in a flat lie. He flat said, I will not arm the South China Sea. And then he did. And so we're starting to see in Xi Jinping somebody that's going to be hard to deal with. You can say an awful lot about the communist Chinese, but they tended not to lie. They told us if we crossed the 38th parallel, they were going to come in. They, they told the Indians what was going to happen on the Indian border. They told the Vietnamese what was going to happen on the Vietnamese border. And then they carried through on what they said. So that, that, that has to be looked at in its own way. We have the tendency to think that all warfare is based on deception. That is a great term, because that means that you think everything they say is a lie, which is not a very good way to look at it. Sometimes, many times, most times, the Chinese do exactly what they said they were going to do. We have the other tensions down to the, the, this Taiwan Straits crisis. We have had President Biden talk to Xi Jinping. Almost nothing seems to come out of that. And, and time will tell, because history normally uh, will get there. Next slide. This is where we are in official U.S. policy. I believe that Washington, D.C. sees this now as completely going upwards. It's just going to get worse and worse. I think the history that I've described from 1950 to now will tell you it's much more complex than that. There are chances for ups and downs, and there are contingencies of things that could happen in other places in the world that could change that path. It is not inevitable that the United States will go to war with China. Going to war with one-fifth of mankind that has nuclear weapons in their home waters with the government that they have should not ever be taken lightly or even thought about lightly. What are our red lines that could cause us to go to war? And I think both Taiwan and Korea that we've heard about before, there, there are at least dotted red lines that are out there. Right now, they're the pacing challenge. What does that mean? If you're going to have a budget almost $800 billion, where are you going to spend your money? More ships that we need, uh, more planes that we need, but the United States Army and the Air Force are going to worry about A-10s. Uh, I think that would be, you know, you can send them to the Ukraine if you like, but why? Is that the most important weapon system out there? So we're arguing among ourselves about the weapon systems for the future against the pacing threat. And I'm sorry for the Army guys in the room, but that happens to be Navy first, Air Force second. And for both of them, we need alliances in the Pacific to be able to support those platforms. And I... I'm just hoping that the guys up in the 11th Arctic Light Infantry Airborne enjoy jumping into the Arctic. But there may be some other places in Asia that they need to go as well. Next slide, please. So there you are. It's the Emperor Xi. Will he maintain the mandate of heaven? The last two years of COVID have done a job on the Chinese economy. The government of China is, has promised its people that it will improve their lives economically. They don't seem to mind the intrusive nature of the government, the big eye watching them everywhere. But you noticed how fast Xi Jinping turned on COVID from complete lockdown to complete unlockdown. 
They can change their policy overnight. The question is, is it competitor to enemy? Or is it competitor and a change back to one of the earlier arrangements that we've seen over the last seven decades? Next slide. I skipped some folks in here, uh, but I wanted to put the slide up there. Here are the official leaders of China. But trying to figure out who the official leader of China is is always difficult because it's really the head of the party. Because it is the Chinese Communist Party that you have to look at for what's going to change in China. So with that, I'm ready for your questions, I hope. Next slide. Oh, we're good. I'm done, sir. Thank you, Dr. Babb, as always, for the great presentation. As well as all the speakers being great, and everybody can uh, uh, you know, agree with that, right? So we've been always lucky with our experts from CJSC and across the country. And this partnership keeps increasing and expanding. This is great. Now is the time for questions, answers, and comments. Uh, and the most like, uh, liked stage of our discussion usually for our audiences. So to generate the discussion, I would like to ask a panel, what should be our and our partner strategic end state in the Asia Pacific? I know, I know, but you can try. <laughs> Who would like to begin? Dr. Bear, please. I'll start and go this way. The biggest thing that we need to do is show some strategic patience. So for the students in the room that just got done the American way of war, understanding that patience is not one of our virtues. I, I, I think I've shown that over the last 70 years, things can change. So that to me, the biggest thing we need to do strategically is to show some patience. And there is a good possibility that China is doing things to itself that will be uh, very much in our favor if we would just let them do it. OK. Anybody else from the panel? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. We're supposed to be moving this way. Thanks, Dr. Kelly, for setting me up for that, yeah. Um, to parlay off Jeff's point, that, and again, the students in the room, specifically mine back there, right? You've heard this before. That China right now thinks they're being contained. Right, which is a fantastic Cold War grand strategy that we no longer follow, by the way. Um, I, I would argue that what we need to do as, as the United States is, is figure out what we want to achieve, which I'm not sure we want, we've done that yet, like define a political objective and then build a grand strategy to achieve it, uh, much like we did with containment. So the Chinese seem to think we have a grand strategy, which we don't. So maybe we need to make that next step, define what we want to achieve in the world and the globe, and then build a cohesive whole government approach to achieve it in a slow and deliberate way, much like we did during the Cold War, which it doesn't have to be military power. It can be slow, subtle power. You can have relationships with folks, whether it be economic, whether it be military, whether it be informational or even diplomatic. And those can shift over time. But again, patience is the key, but also having a well-defined what do you want to achieve mm -hmm. is indicative of that, which we don't have. When you speak, you speak Speaking of that. Okay, uh, Dr. Lee, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, from allies' perspective, I think uh, both, uh, you know, think tank level, also a government level. I think the one key question when it comes to U.S.-China rivalry is how far U.S. is willing to go with China. The end state, as you uh, both you refer to, is uh, is it going to be at the end of the day you're going to become friends again, or you just push down China as a distant second that cannot challenge again uh, United States power, and that's okay with you, just like what U.S. did to Japan during the 80s. If that state happens, then it's going to be things are going to be okay. Or is going to be any kinetic collision between the two? I think uh, from Allies' perspective, uh, the clear communication about the goals and intentions as Washington is thinking through 
sharing the vision with the allies, I think, is very important because allies as a democracies, we also have to manage our domestic politics. And when your vision is not clear, it's very difficult for allies' politics to persuade their own domestic politics because, like Samsung, or SK Hine, you know, our semiconductors, 60% of South Korea semiconductors, you know, they go to China and they want to know, you know, what, what, what do you want to do eventually? So, because, you know, it takes time to plan things out. Excellent, excellent. Doctor, uh, Mr. Xiao, please. Yeah, um, I think, uh, and guys, I'm speaking certainly in my own personal opinion on this matter. Um, I would say that, you know, there should be threefold uh, in terms of the objectives that uh, U.S. policy should seek to uh, achieve um, in the Indo-Pacific. One is to counter PRC hegemony. I think it's clear that, you know, PRC is seeking hegemony in the region. And I think if they were to be able to um, uh, take Taiwan, it would result in that and, and could lead to global uh, implications as well. Secondly is to establish a favorable balance of power, and that mean, requires reinforcing alliances as well as building new partnerships. That also includes not only utilizing, not only relying upon uh, military uh, alliances, but building economic and trade partnerships that has been, I think, an under leveraged aspect of overall uh, U.S. strategy towards the region. I think it was a strategic mistake of the former administration to pull out of the, um, the TPP, the, tra uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have allowed the United States to really end it and um, uh, to uh, write the rules of the road in terms of uh, economic and trade um, interactions that would have built, I think, really reinforced a, a strong economic linkages that would uh, allow uh, for uh, to wean off many of the uh, Indo-Pacific countries from the PRC, uh, and that has been where very significant leverage that the PRC has utilized to coerce and also to um, uh, entice uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, countries in the region to uh, accept uh, its um, you know its its preferences. Uh, and thirdly, um, I would say that you know. Uh, the United States should, uh, and her like-minded allies and partners should advance the League of Democracies. I think for too long this idea has been put on the sideline and seen as too provocative or so, or too Cold War-esque, uh, perhaps, and that that would provoke a, a, a type of reaction on the part of, you know, authoritarian countries to create the type of uh, authoritarian alliances. But look, we haven't created a League of Democracies and the, those are authoritarian alliances are happening. And, uh, and I think with or without a League of Democracies where like-minded countries and partners should be, can work together, I mean, I, I think we are um, you know, tying our hands behind our back here in terms of uh, shaping the conditions uh, and leveraging our assets in a way that, um, uh, that could uh, really meaningfully shape uh, the future of the Indo-Pacific region um, uh, if we don't uh, consider the critical importance of our shared values and, 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 and being able to execute that in a more substantive uh, manner of, uh, of shaping regional politics and, and, and security. Uh, so those are my three. Excellent, um, excellent. Uh, just to remind to our audiences, everything, all the points, are discussion points and opinions do not represent the official position of the U.S. government. We make this uh, standard statement all the time. So. Uh, at this point, uh, the floor is yours. We will start with this audience, and then we'll go to outstation. Sir, please introduce yourself, ask your question, make a comment. Uh, please, uh, if you please come to the microphone, because it's being re video recorded. Mm -hmm. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Quick. Uh, I'm actually downstairs in the pre-command uh, course. I saw the sign, and I recognized couple of names here, so I thought I would come by and say hello, Dr. Kalik, Dr. Bab, good to see you. Uh, I, actually, I actually have a separate question about the, 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 uh, the Nanjing tour that, we, that was canceled in 2017. If we could go, if we could revisit that at some point. Uh, <laughs> so, I'd love to take yeah, thank you. Uh, so my, my actual, my, my real question has to do with um, some of the, the Peter Zans of the world seem to think that China is on a 20, 30 year trajectory to collapse. And sure, there are some metrics that may telegraph that. I'm not entirely sure. And then there are those who would say, you know, it's a moving target, it's not a static situation. Things will continue to move and evolve depending on who's in charge. Things will continue to move depending on 
us. So what are some of your perspective on that part of the equation as China progress over the next 20, 30 years, never mind how we look in 20, 30 years? With that, I yield back the balance. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to begin with the answer from the panel, please? I think we'll do the story I'll certainly, I can certainly start. Um, there, are, there are economic issues in China. And if you go to China, there's the pollution issues. There's the demographic issues. China has significant internal problems that it's going to have to deal with. And so um, Susan Shirk's new book, takes one path, it's another path that says, because of that, we're, we're entering a special dangerous period in that over the next five to seven years, China is actually going to start to go down. So right now, we keep straight lining, its Air Force is going to get better, its Navy is going to get better. That should level off, and there's an argument that it's going down, and all of a sudden, if they're going to take Taiwan, they need to do it before the porcupine strategy is put in place, before uh, the lessons of the Ukraine get into, into place. Um, yeah, I would like to write an article that's 2035, when the eagle and the dragon again soar together. That, that, that what Russia does, it, that Russia and China are the real enemies in Asia. Um, more of a Mackinder strategy than, than a Mahan strategy. So we're going Mahan, I'm going Mackinder, and there's a chance that that it, it could change, but it's so volatile and so contingent that I'm not betting a lot of money on it. Excellent. Excellent discussion. Anybody else from the panel? Please, um, Mr. You know, Sher. Okay, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, I think that estimates that assessments that the Chinese, the People's Republic of China will collapse has been made for quite some time now, and people have been making that prediction for well over 20, 30 years, in fact, that China will collapse. There were, you know, some of that was based on the inevitable evolution uh, as a result of China's embrace of capitalism, that this will ultimately lead to liberalization and the collapse of the, you know, a transformation or a peaceful transformation of the Chinese Communist Party, or that, you know, the liberating aspects of technology of the internet will, you know, unleash uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Chinese people's urge for freedom. And yet, you know, with capitalism, I think what we have seen at least is that, you know, the efforts to try to engage and consign the PRC into the international trading and economic system has actually worked, you know, in the opposite direction where, in fact, the PRC has been changing the rules and utilizing those rules and, and, and manipulating that in its favor and, and really creating these very huge distortions in the, hum in the free market that has overturned that theory of, 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 of uh, evolution there, uh, political evolution there, uh, that could lead to its collapse. And as well as technology. Now we're seeing a very uh, hyper-techno surveillance uh, regime that it has utilized to be, be able to strengthen this control and not the least weaken it necessarily. And so I think the Chinese Communist Party has demonstrated itself to be quite resilient. And, um, and while I agree that there are real severe challenges ahead for the Communist Party, like the demographic aspects of, of China's population growth, declining uh, population growth, as well as, you know, economic, uh, you know, um, slowdown. You know, unless we're talking about a, a real severe economic, you know, collapse, um, it's, uh, I, I think it's something that we can't depend on uh, or uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to sort of formulate uh, policies uh, to respond to, and as, and as such, I think it's something to watch for, uh, but n not necessarily something to, n to 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 rely on in any kind of long-term planning for uh, for uh, for with regards to the PRC. So. Excellent. Anybody else, Dr. Kill? Mm -hmm. Nice to see you, Tom. By the way, um, 
The resiliency part is important, right? That, that if you follow a Soviet model, you can kind of see the Soviet system withering, withering, cracking, cracking, and getting worse. What's unique about China, from my perspective as a Cold War historian, is that it seems to be eminently resilient. When we think it's cracking, okay, awesome, and all of a sudden, five years later, they're not. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to be following a similar model, so maybe we need to kind of break out of our Cold War construct and think, you know, bigger ideas, bigger thoughts about, is it really about, you know, it's gonna, it's either ascending or it's falling, or, or no, maybe there's a middle ground that we have to just kind of be deliberate and slow with and figure this out one step at a time, and what we want to achieve. And, and, this, is where, and, and this is where I feel like uh, I, I deeply admire those who have lots of data and formulate thoughts and opinions through data, data-driven, data-informed uh, policies, opinion, what have you. And yet, uh, exactly situations like these where I feel like uh, there are just certain things that data can't account for. And hence, the human mind comes back into play through history, through, through, through some sort of histor uh, historical perspective and whatnot. Uh, uh, the, the less tangible, ex the X factor that is seldom accounted for. So, yeah, I mean, George yeah. Kennan at the beginning of the Cold War said there are inherent contradictions in the Soviet system, which will lead to its inevitable failure. And, and people were like, okay, how long? Well, I can't tell you that. It's just, it's going to happen, right? Just be patient. But the patience is the problem, right? All right. Anybody else? Yes, Dr. Lee. Mm -hmm. I think I'm not divulging a, uh, a privileged information here, but uh, you know, at Harvard Kennedy School, you know, there is an international relations professor, Stephen Walt, and uh, at the end of his class, um, you know, teaching international relations for the last 40 years, one thing that he regrets in a way, or he realized his mistake is that too much blind trust on statistical data and uh, using that as uh, something pointing out to you know something meaningful it's it's important but you know i think there's you know social trend that you know you know blind trust about what you know these numbers statistics figures comparison charts and graphs show to you and uh, you show that to convince your audience or your boss or your decision makers i think uh, as a uh, 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 intellectual uh, uh, leaders, I think we should be careful about it. And the piggyback on the similar sentiment, you know, there is a book published in 2000, uh, The Coming Collapse of China, right? Uh, that was, and uh, 23 years later, we are still waiting for the collapse of China. Similarly, there is also uh, collapse scenarios of North Korea in the 1990s, and the uh, U.S. government was supposed to in 1994, there was an agreement called the Agreed Framework between North Korea and the United States, uh, keeping up on nuclear programs, uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, U.S. government was supposed to provide North Korea half a million crude oil each year, but U.S. government stopped. Why? Because U.S. government expected North Korea would collapse very soon. So either way, this guy is going to collapse, so why should I provide half a million ton each year? but the North Korea is still here, so we should not underestimate the resilience of the uh, enemy. At the same time, I think, uh, uh, you, know, you know, focusing on China is important, but at the same time, focusing on U.S. strength and weakness, I think it's also very important, because when you talk about, you know, China's rise at the same time, on the other dimension, there is a, a supposed perception that relative decline of the United States, which has been a dominant theme among IR scholars for the last 10 years. So, but I think that at the end of the day, uh, one key driving factor for U.S. victory in what uh, form or fashion that might be, uh, I think that whether you could have your allies and partners on your side in this crusade, I think this is very, very important uh, for the, uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, crusade uh, in, in that you know, Washington is thinking about a vis a uh, uh, Beijing. Thank you so much. Great discussion. Is that answers your question, sir? Thank you so much for the question and for great answers. So if it's okay, now we'll go as we usually try to balance to outstation one question and then we'll go back to the Arnold, if that's okay. One question from, our, from outstation. All right. Thank you, Dr. I. Uh, we have a large group at our sister school, the U.S. Army Warrant Officer Career College at Fort Rucker, Alabama. 
and they ask, how might the recent acknowledgement of demo demographic decline by the PRC impact the likelihood or timing of military action by the PLA in Taiwan, South China Sea, or the greater region? Okay, is the question clear? Who would like to begin with the answer? Anybody? All right, let me take first crack Mr. at that. Sharp. But let me take uh, maybe a contrarian view on the demographic, demographic decline uh, trend and its implications for uh, a military conflict over Taiwan. Let's think about the fact that, you know, given uh, the longstanding one child you know, policy of the PRC and many families having only, you know, uh, one son or a daughter, um, how likely would it be uh, that they would be willing to send their sons and daughters to war and, and die? And how, how likely would that make it so that they would be um, comfortable uh, with that? And, and how sustainable would a conflict uh, over Taiwan uh, be uh, maintained if the war is dragged on and their only sons and daughters are, are, are dying uh, in such a war? And as such, um, I would say that, you know, it would not necessarily mean a straight line between the demographic decline that it would be the driving force for why the PRC would invade. In fact, I think that there are more constraints uh, in, in some of the existing, um, uh, uh, existing parameters uh, that perhaps might militate against uh, the urge to uh, engage in a military conflict over Taiwan. Excellent. Anybody else from the distinguished panel? I think Not that, mm -hmm. um, you know, in pure military, you know, uh, 101, you know, number of population means that, you know, number of soldiers and number of population decreases means the number of soldiers decreasing. That's the period. Uh, and this is uh, uh, March. Next month, April, India is scheduled to take over China as the number one populous nation in the world. The problem with China is that this trend of a declining population is not going to reverse anytime soon. This is going to be for a foreseeable future. It's continuing trend. So I think this is a real uh, dilemma for Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, leadership because this trend is going to be sustained for a while. And uh, finally, Population is very important, even for not just for the military, but also economic growth. Because when the China 1978 reform and opening up started, they needed a lot of workers to work at the factories. And the, the surplus uh, workers in the China's rural areas who don't work in farms, they went to the cities and the work at the factories, and they became the backbone of China's economic miracle. But this miracle, source of miracle, is declining. So I think this, it has a very huge, a, 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 that you know, we have not uh, unforeseen implications that we continue to have to watch. Excellent. Anybody else from the panel? All right, great discussion, and I think it's a time to go back to the Arnold. Sir, please introduce yourself, ask a question, and make Good a comment. Good afternoon. I'm Joseph Donaldbain. I'm on the faculty here at the Department of Joint Interagency Multinational Operations. It's good. Since, uh, for a long time, we've been served by a policy of strate strategic ambiguity with uh, concern to Taiwan. Although I would argue that uh, when President Truman put the United States Navy into the Taiwan Straits in 1950, that was not ambiguous. So I would like to ask the panel that in a cost-benefit analysis, would we not be better served by a policy of strategic certainty? The United States and its treaty allies in the region, assuming they sign up for it, uh, will not allow any aggression against Taiwan. Okay, thank you. Anybody to begin with? Sure, I'll Mr. take that Shari. question. No, I, you know, that's, um, I really liked how you framed it. Um, you used a term that uh, certainty 
as opposed to clarity, which is oftentimes the, you know, sort of considered to be the, the opposites of strategic ambiguity. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for, to just have some context as to the uh, approach of strategic ambiguity that had been sort of uh, been the, the thrust of how the United States approached cross-strait relations, um, is that it was a sort of a policy of dual deterrence, right? It was on the one hand to deter the PRC from, you know, invading uh, Taiwan, uh, but not by not explicitly uh, make, uh, cl making certain that the United States would intervene in the event of a military conflict, and at the same time deterring Taipei for a long period of time, actually, uh, from retaking the mainland. Um, you know, of course, I think that second latter uh, cause is no longer of, of much concern, and I think the deterrent part of it on the, the Taipei side is now focused on, you know, um, that Taipei does not take any provocative action that would uh, provoke uh, Beijing uh, from um, uh, invading uh, Taiwan. And so I think the sort of the binary framing of ambiguity versus clarity has been somewhat unhelpful because the opposition to the uh, clarity uh, position has been focused on a, I think, a, a, a sort of a, um, a sort of scarecrow argument where in that uh, no one is actually um, offering that there is an unconditional guarantee by which the United States would intervene in any circumstances uh, uh, under a, um, uh, in, in the event of, of an invasion of Taiwan. I think no one offered that as the solution. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there, are, there are always conditions involved in any type of, um, you know, sort of uh, any type of uh, a guarantee that, uh, may be involved, even during the time when the United States and Taiwan had a, uh, had a mutual defense treaty, uh, there were uh, conditions uh, involved in that. And so I do think that there is a uh, important debate um, uh, to be had about the need for greater clarity um, uh, with regards to a U.S. commitment uh, to Taiwan's defense, and I think it would be within existing policy uh, to do so, if you, uh, you know, read the language of the Taiwan Relations Act, as well as the six assurances, uh, as well as the premises that went into the, uh, the communiques uh, through the, uh, the various um, now declassified memos with regards to uh, uh, President Reagan's uh, instructions uh, through the NSC memos with that, you know, the... Um, that the uh, that these are premised on the fact that these issue, that the dispute be resolved peacefully, uh, that there it, they can be read that there are broad commitments to, uh, to 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 Taiwan's defense, and so I think it is entirely consistent uh, with U.S. policy that President Biden now has said on four occasions uh, that the United States has an obligation. Uh, uh, well, the United States. Has an obligation come, you know, to 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 defend Taiwan in the event of a uh, Chinese attack against it, and I think the responses, uh, in large part by mm, media's and observers, that somehow the clarifications made subsequently by administration officials that this was not a change in policy uh, has been, I think. Um, uh, and the reactions to it, as if this was a, a sort of a break in U.S. approach, uh, or a break in U.S. policy is, is, is inaccurate, you know, and I think that this is, you know, that strategic ambiguity was never, ne you know, is, ne is not explicitly defined uh, in any of those documents. So certainly the president is within his right, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to make such statements with regards to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, position and I think to the other the subsidiary point that you made uh, on the importance of greater certainty is well taken and I agree with you know with the framing of that in that it is important in terms of also encouraging allies and partners in their respective debates 
uh, both internally um, uh, about the, the, the necessity to make the, ne the, the preparations and planning on uh, what to do in the event of a Taiwan contingency. I think in the case of Japan, for instance, it's quite interesting to see that in the third statement that President Biden made, I believe it was the third statement that he had made with regards to uh, the defense of Taiwan, he made it in Tokyo next uh, to Prime Minister uh, Kishida, uh, right before a quad meeting where in that, um, where I think it was a deliberate uh, effort on a part of the administration to signal U.S. resolve and certainty about what is necessary so that it can encourage the type of debate that needed to be, ha to be happening in Tokyo as well. Because, you know, I think if the United States uh, expects Japan to play any role in a Taiwan contingency, that has to be worked out internally within their political and political process. And certainly, it should be no surprise to anyone that you know uh, the, the 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 Japanese bureaucracy, the government bureaucracy, is is quite uh, quite slow in in responding, and as such, requires that type of political uh, important um, you know sort of um, stimulus that uh, I think only. The, a, a statement as such by the President of the United States can and provide. So, um, yeah, so that would be my response. Excellent. Anybody else from the Thank panel? You, have. Yeah, I, if I can uh, make a okay. follow up. Yes. Yeah. Does that answer your Let question, me, sir? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. So, the world's most successful alliance, NATO, hmm. it's, is founded on an ironclad premise an attack on one is an attack on all. And that's very clear. There's no ambiguity about that. Maybe that's what we need in the Pacific. Well, remember, we had one in the Pacific called CETO, right, uh, under the Eisenhower administration, which never, never solidified, much like NATO, and always had problems because Japan, the Philippines could never quite see eye to eye what would happen if a Taiwan kicked off or something like that. So I, th I think the policy of ambiguity, I've wrestled with this too, right? Just come out and be strong, right? It's going to you know, maximize your deterrent posture. But the reality is, I think ambiguity gives you more flexibility behind the scenes. Um, and NATO is a great example, but NATO is also a unique political, social, cultural element in Western Europe. And that model did not work well when the Eisenhower administration tried to solidify it and rebuild it in, in Southeast Asia. Dr. Beth, please. The only thing I, I would like to add to that is. Ending ambiguity is a silver bullet. And, and I think you have to decide when you want to play it. It's still working. They haven't attacked. Um, the president has said four times that we will defend Taiwan, and the State Department came out and reworded it the, virtually the next day, which says they're still doing ambiguity to me. Uh, so at the end of the day, when you declare we're going back to 1979 and we're going to have a defense treaty with Taiwan, there better be U.S. military forces put into Taiwan that day. Or the Chinese will wake up in the morning and have been deceived that we've already moved them in. I think declaring that defense posture, putting us back to 1979, is a bullet that we should have, you know, somewhere around the weapon, but I, I think it's just too important a change right now to, to contemplate. But certainly the, the, those folks in Washington that say we need to end ambiguity now. Okay. In well, I mean, just one more additional point that I would add to that. You know, there is, a, I think, a, an element of political deterrence here that is often missing in the discussion about um, the overall sort of uh, deterrent value of moving to, shifting to greater clarity on U.S. commitments to Taiwan's defense, oftentimes it's overly emphasizing on, well, what is the military value of this if the PRC is or the PLA is already planning for, um, you know, a, uh, the uh, potential U.S. intervention uh, in the event of a, of a Taiwan contingency. And it's that political dimension that I think is, you know, is often neglected that, uh, that when there is that absolute certainty uh, that it would, um, not only in terms of how it would impact the leadership, but also the, the population 
as well. And, uh, and I think that that is indeed a, a, an important um, uh, um, dimension to the overall uh, strategic ambiguity versus clarity. But I will you now, I think, include certainty as, a, as an important dimension within that broader sort of, uh, uh, I think, somewhat unhelpful binary construct of ambiguity versus clarity that, that you know, I think that there can be greater certainty without necessarily shifting to um, with, 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 with absolute unconditional clarity, right? So. Perfect. Excellent discussion. Dr. Lee, please. I think the only angle I want to add is that, you know, after Beijing said four times that there is no change in policy over Taiwan, right? But what about halfway around the world from China's perspective? Does China still believe that there is no change in policy? I think this is the question that you know we should think about. My sense is that I think they are looking ahead. They're looking at that practically. They sense that you know Washington's policy on Taiwan de facto changed, but the, for the political convenience, they're still using this uh, no change in policy rhetoric for convenient political convenience. Excellent. It's a really fascinating discussion and. Is that answers your question, sir? It's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the great question and the, for the great answers. I'm a very, very positive guy. You know, I want to be <laughs> but that's really a good discussion. So I think we have time only for one question from the outstation because we had the last question from here. Now we're going to outstation. All right. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Josh Yarborough from the U.S. Army Reserve Command ask, what is the panel's assessment of the PRC's ability to forge together a counter-Western bloc, New World Order, considering recent Saudi-Iran reapproachment brokered by China and Xi's ongoing visit to Moscow? Excellent question. Who would like to begin with the answer? Anybody? As a historian, I need to wait 20 years <laughs> to figure out what it means. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time right now. All right. Uh, I'll start to try to be controversial. Dr. Beth, please. Let them have it. <laughs> if they think that they can make Saudi Arabia and Iran get along, if they think they can do something in Afghanistan, welcome them to the game. <laughs> it, if it's a great game that's going to be played, um, we've been playing it for a while. Maybe it's time for us to just so some strategic patience, see how they do, and see how much trouble they're going to get into. What I'm seeing right now is they're not making friends in the region. They've probably driven Japan further than many of us ever thought Japan would go in terms of this, its anti-Chineseness. Um, India being part of the Quad now is we don't have a naturally good relationship. So. At, at the end of the day, we can kind of, you know, this idea that China wants to be the global hegemon, uh, I'm not so sure. The lessons of history of China is looking at empires, of which it is one of the oldest empires, uh, would say that they should be a little bit more reticent on some of the places they go and some of the messes they get into. If you're looking for how do we know that China is going down the road? When will they start deploying more forces globally? We talk about a Navy base here and there, but at the end of the day, a Navy base is a pier in a warehouse and maybe an airstrip next to it. So we should be looking ahead at those, looking at where China is going, um, and we can look in Africa. As a matter of fact, the number of peacekeeping forces uh, that China has put out around the world has actually gone down by about half over the last five years. Um, so I think China will be a little bit leery of getting into some. So that means we need to look more closely at where they do go and why they're going. Excellent. Anybody else from the panel? Dr. Lee. I think what China is aiming at is not necessarily successfully forming an anti-U.S. coalition, but rather weakening U.S. Uh, alliance network. Uh, China is projecting the image of a peacemaker in Saudi Arabia and Iran deal. Also, you know, Xi Jinping is in Russia. 
you know, I don't expect a great outcome from them, but then at least I think the audience is not necessarily Putin, but I think Xi Jinping is trying to impress the European countries that, hey guys, you know, you know, we could still work with together. Uh, and then I think uh, at the end of the day, by weakening uh, U.S. relations with NATO, I think that is uh, already, uh, you know, giving China a wiggling room in terms of, you know, operational sense. At the same time, I think in the future, even though Washington has this Indo-Pacific strategy, but I think the future of whether, you know, who is going to be the winner between U.S. and China will not be determined by Indo-Pacific, but rather I think it's determined in Europe because NATO is the primary ally of the United States and Indo-Pacific region countries like Japan and South Korea, Australia, we will look at how NATO strongly, closely cooperate with the United States. That will give a message to the countries in the Indo-Pacific. So I think strengthening NATO alliance between U.S. and NATO, I think that is very, very important. And I think Xi Jinping knows with what game he's playing there. Uh, uh, and I think there will be more summit level exchanges this year between China and European countries. This is something that we have to watch very closely. Excellent. Anybody else? It's a perfect time to wrap up the session here, right? And uh, we, we encourage the, the, the audience in Arnold and our outstations, please send your questions and comments and you will see the, our contact information in the last slide. Next slide, please. So this is CASO's capabilities across the country and globally, and it keeps expanding day by day. So in support of our national security and our partner's national security. Next slide, please. So this is our contact information. So uh, CASO, the, the video of today's session including the related publications, the uh, PowerPoint slides, etc., will be posted within the next several days on this website. So the video will be also on the CASOS playlist on YouTube. This is the Facebook page because it was a video stream, I mean the live stream, the video is already there, right? So. Um, now, uh, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank our distinguished panel for their willingness to share their great expertise with, with us in support of our missions. Please join me in giving a warm welcome. We would like to thank our leadership for its continuous and very helpful support. General Foley uh, couldn't uh, make it this uh, last minute, something came up. Dr. Kim, who introduced the panel today, our dean and chief academic officer. Um, so we appreciate CAC, Army, UCJC teams for their support in preparing and planning our events all these years. So uh, with that, this concludes our session. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you very much.